Okay, right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Martin, Martin Lee. I'm one of the uh, technical leads from Cisco Talos. What I want to talk to you today about is WannaCry. I mean, it's now impossible to have any form of security presentation without mentioning WannaCry. So we might as well get uh, at least one of the day's WannaCry sessions out of the way. This presentation was really one that's born of frustration. So two days before WannaCry hit on May the 10th, I was at a conference in the Netherlands talking to government regulators about the risk of self-propagating ransomware and how it was going to hit critical national infrastructure and how really, we really, really need to do something about it because this has been long, long overdue. So, what really, really surprised me about WannaCry was just how long it took to happen and why it didn't happen you know, three, four, five years earlier. Obviously, uh, you would have seen it in the news. Uh, it caused large, large amounts of disruption uh, across the world. Uh, you will almost certainly have heard of the, uh, of the disruption that it caused to the NHS in the UK. Uh, one other one which is really, really interesting on the bottom left, uh, that's a car park, car park payment terminal. Uh, all the car park payment terminals in the Netherlands got hit by one guy and got taken out. Which is kind of interesting, you know, why on earth are payment terminals open to the internet on port 445 in some way? Really didn't make sense. Very, very quickly, a couple of interesting things about WannaCry. Obviously, uh, it contains the Eternal Blue exploit. That, in turn, leads to the installation of the double pulsar backdoor, which is used for the malware to install itself on the vulnerable devices. First question, why? Because if you've got the exploit there, surely you don't need the backdoor, because if you've triggered the exploit and you can install code on a vulnerable machine, why bother having the double pulsar? Something here is a little bit odd. Uh, almost looks like someone's just copy-pasted the code to put it into the, the worm. Why have the two together? It's kind of a strange choice. Um, it then goes on, obviously, scans the internal uh, IP address space, looking for vulnerable, other vulnerable machines, and also scans external systems. When it finds a vulnerable system, we've got that ed eternal blue exploit being triggered installing the double pulsar backdoor, which is then used to install the malware itself. First thing it will do, and remember this for later, it'll check the kill switch domain. And if it gets anything back from that HTTP GET request, then it quits out and it doesn't go anything further. So here we've got a really, really good trace to find devices that are infected. If it doesn't get anything back, well then it will go on to scan the internal uh, IP address and infect other machines. It'll install the malware as, well, it'll drop the task scheduler executable and then install that as a service on the infected device so we've got that persistence. Then things start getting a little bit interesting and a little bit different. That task scheduler goes on to encrypt the files and then we've got this really clumsy, strange uh, system that we've got all these other files that are dropped We've got a separate executable, which is deleting the temporary files created as part of the, of the encryption process. We've got this other file, this other executable task, SE, which then goes on to uh, call the wannadecryptor.exe, which is actually displaying the ransom note. So unlike other ransomware, sort of the more professional ransomware that we see, where the ransomware is a, a, an image or the desktop background in the infected device, here we've got a separate executable displaying the ransom note, which is kind of interesting. Suffice to say, this really is quite different from the professional criminal ransomware that we see in circulation. So it looks like a new entrant into the game, or at least someone who's writing this in a slightly clumsy way. But it was very, very effective in terms of spreading. And the thing that really gets me is, well, why? Why? What, what led to this happening? What actually caused this to take, you know, take place across the internet and take root across the internet and spread so quickly? 
in my mind, and this is my personal view, we've got four factors in the threat environment that are enabling WannaCry to happen. We have ransomware as a, bi as a business, as a criminal business model. There's big money to be made in ransomware. We've also got a long history of self-propagating malware, of malware that can spread and can copy itself and infect devices and spread autonomously across the internet. We've also got this quite interesting thing of a democratization of threat, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And the big one, really, is also complacency. You know, we talk about security, obviously in the business we hear about security uh, so much. We're securing systems, but there's an awful lot of businesses and a lot of systems out there where the bare minimum, if that, is being done to secure them. But nevertheless, more and more devices are being connected and are being exposed to these kinds of threats. So let's start with the first one, self-propagating malware. Actually, I'll ask a question. Does anyone know when self-propagating malware dates from? The first occurrence. Sorry? 85. It's a very good guess. Higher? Lower? Anyone think higher? More recently than 85? Anyone think earlier? Go on, give me a guess. Joe, give me a guess. 79. 79. It's a very, very good guess. Any others? 1949, we have our very first theoretical, it must be said, uh, theory of self-reproducing automata, written by John Neumann. He designed the very first self-propagating piece of computer code, actually without having a computer, which is a fairly neat trick. Um, the, the theory behind it, his book, was published after his death in 1966, but the work had been done in 1949. So we have a very, very long history of self-propagating computer code. Fred Cohen, who was a graduate student in the early 80s, did a lot of work on the theory of computer viruses and predicting how they could spread and actually showing that this would happen. But his sort of theoretical underpinning of self-propagating code was actually predated by what was happening in the field. Joe, your guess of 1979 was pretty good. Our very first example of self-propagating code is actually from 1971, the Creeper, which is spreading on the uh, DEC PDP-10s of the time connected to ARPANET. So we have our first example of self-propagating code that would spread from machine to machine, dating way back 1971. 1979, uh, we have a group of researchers creating uh, this Zerpark uh, worm. This is actually the first example referred to as a worm. They were looking at how their code could spread uh, internally on their research machines. Uh, they left it running overnight and found that actually it had jumped out of their little research environment and had gone on and had, and had infected all sorts of devices causing them to crash. So here, 1979, we have our first example of a worm doing more damage than the writer ever thought possible. Kind of interesting. Uh, also interestingly, um, I'm sure you will have heard all the fuss at the moment about fileless malware and how to detect malware that doesn't uh, exist in a file and talking about how this is something new. Yeah, this, 1979, this is your first fileless malware. Fileless malware is not a new thing. It's been happening for a long, long time. Uh, Fred Cohen, 1983, talking about viruses, talking about how they could spread in the wild. Our first example, the Elk cloner from 1982, the year before, this is our first Apple uh, II malware that would spread via diskette. And then we go on a few years, 1986, and we've got our first MS-DOS uh, malware spreading in the, uh, in the wild, which really is sort of that grandfather of, uh, of Windows malware that we're seeing today. Our first big example of an internet worm that spread and did loads of damage is the Morris worm from 1988, where we've got a young researcher writing a worm, uh, wants to try and infect systems, see how much it could spread. Again, hasn't learned from the past, from 10 years prior to that. The worm spreads out of control, 
causes enormous amounts of havoc on the internet at the time, uh, exploiting network vulnerabilities in these systems, spreading like wildfire, causing all sorts of havoc. The early 2000s, if you're of a certain age, you might have received an email, I love you, from one of your friends or colleagues in the spring of, uh, of 2000. I don't know if anyone got that. Uh, that, again, an early example of self-propagating malware. Had a very nice uh, social engineering trick. You get a, a, a message, I love you, from the cute girl at reception. Of course you're going to click and open that attachment. Who wouldn't? It then reads your, uh, your Outlook contacts and then emails, it sp emails itself to all of those. Exploiting n networked vulnerabilities on the internet spread like wildfire and caused absolute havoc and brought down email servers across the world. Throughout the 2000s, we've got SQL Slammer, Code Red, a whole series of other worms, again, exploiting network vulnerabilities, spreading like wildfire, causing all sorts of havoc. Our last example, 2008, the Conficker worm. In fact, this is actually still spreading across the internet. If you set up a virtual machine running an old uh, system of Windows XP, almost certainly sooner or later you'll get hit with Conficker. It's still out there. Again, exploited vulnerabilities in network services, spread like wildfire, caused absolute havoc. Are we seeing a pattern here? 2017, tumbleweed, nothing. We hadn't seen a major internet worm since 2008. And so all of these lessons about how quickly these things can spread and the amount of damage that they can cause and how do we detect them and how do we protect systems, that knowledge had been deprioritized or lost. We've got new people coming into the, uh, into the business who don't have the experience of it. But all those lessons were lost and so we come into the beginning of 2017 and yeah, worms are, are missing, presumed dead, presumed extinct, a dinosaur of malware. In fact, this wasn't the case. Also going on, we've got the development of ransomware and cybercrime as a way of making money. You know, it's great to be able to make money with malware, to be able to infect systems. You know, maybe we can find some really interesting data that can be exfiltrated and sold on the black market. In fact, that's, you know, really a lot of work. Uh, also, not all data can be sold. Uh, there is very little in the terms of black market for second-hand PowerPoint presentations or indeed pictures of my dog. Uh, nobody really wants to buy this in an underground market. Nevertheless, it's something which is really valuable to me. So if I turn on my computer, and instead of my lovely presentation to give you this morning, I get a ransom note, someone has held my otherwise valueless PowerPoint presentation to ransom and won't give it back unless I pay money, yeah, of course you're gonna pay. Or at least, of course you're gonna consider paying. But again, ransomware is not a new thing. Again, I'll ask the question, when do we think ransomware dates from? Can you put a date, a year, on the earliest ransomware? Give me a guess. 1987, that's a very, very good guess. Higher, lower? 48. Wow, well, no, that's, that, that's, that's really, really optimistic. Uh, 87 was a really, really good guess. In fact, the first example of ransomware dates from uh, the very tail end of the 19, 1980s, 1989. Uh, it was genuinely invented by an insane criminal genius. Um, a very interesting story. The guy who uh, created this first uh, piece of ransomware um, actually had a grudge against the medical community, uh, spread this Trojan that looked like a clinical tool. Uh, in fact, if you uh, opened it in your, uh, in your system, it would encrypt the files, only the file names, uh, with a symmetric form of encryption and demand that you pay a ransom by check to an address in Panama. Obviously leading a really big easy trail to find the guy. He was arrested, he was brought to trial and actually found unfit to stand trial due to insanity. So this was a genuine insane criminal genius just like out of Batman. Um, so he invented this first example of ransomware Basically, not a lot happened until we've got this first uh, criminal form of ransomware happening in the mid-2000s, uh, 
spread by email. This time we've got a better way of collecting money, paying through e-gold or e-currencies. Over time, that ransom is increasing in cost bit by bit. The encryption is certainly getting better. And by uh, 2014, we've got these big, very, very professional forms of ransomware which are being spread across the internet. 2016, we've got something new. We've got SamSam, which is our first example of ransomware which is being targeted against organizations specifically. Instead of just trying to spread and infect as many systems as possible, it's going for specific businesses and making more money that way. In fact, there is a lot of money to be made out of ransomware. One of my favorite stories is this one. Um, it's a luxury hotel in Austria. It was reported in the press that uh, the, uh, the, the hotel was hit by ransomware which locked clients in their room. In fact, that wasn't the case. What happened was the computer which programmed the key cards so that guests could get in and out of their room was actually hit with ransomware. So the hotel couldn't check new people in because it couldn't issue a new key card to get into your room. So the functioning of the hotel is brought to a halt. So when the bad guys are claiming a 1,500 euro ransom to be paid, well, yeah, the, of course the hotel is gonna pay. The most interesting thing of this is that it wasn't the first time that it had happened. It was the fourth time that this hotel had got hit with ransomware. And there is nothing that makes me think that this is unusual. Um, so for the bad guys, yeah, if you can just hit this hotel again and again and again, and you can get 1,500 euros per time, and this is only one hotel. So there is a lot of money to be made there for the bad guys to use this as a criminal business model to make money and also to reinvest some of this money in making newer and better forms of ransomware. Which brings us to SamSam. So SamSam was specifically targeted against organizations in the healthcare sector looking to infect the patient care record or those databases that are used in hotels to process patients. If you can do that, the entire hospital grinds to a halt, in which case the bad guys can ask for incrementally much, much, much more money than you can for a hotel and there are enough stories and anecdotes out there about you know fees, ransoms of in excess of $10,000 being paid. There is big money to be made in this. Which brings us to the eve of WannaCry of May the 11th, where we saw the latest form of ransomware, uh, JAF. This is kind of a Russian doll form of ransomware distributed over email. Almost no social engineering in that. We've just got a, a, a title, a subject line, and an attachment. It's a PDF attachment. If you open the email, click on the attachment, it's got JavaScript in that, which will open a Word document, which is embedded within the JavaScript. That will ask you to enable macros in order to open that. If you enable the macros, it will then go on and download the ransomware and encrypt your system, and you will come up with this particular ransom note. This particular malware was the one that much in the industry was confusing with WannaCry. When WannaCry first came out, there were a lot of people saying, yeah, it's spread by email, it's spread by email. When we looked at it, all of the examples that they were giving were actually JAF, which had happened the day before. So it's very easy to get things mixed up. One of the key things that I think is driving innovation in the threat environment is that of threat democratization, of technology moving from very sophisticated threat actors down through to the least sophisticated ones. One of the best examples that I have of threat democratization and the democratization of technology is this. In the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 60s, the world was absolutely captivated that the world's number one superpower, the United States, had this technology where they could peer down from, from space and photograph the missiles in Cuba on the docks 
And this was revolutionary technology that was only available to the, to the world's most sophisticated superpower. Now, anyone in their front room got access to Google Earth? You can go and see exactly the same places, what it looks now. You can go and count the, air, the airplanes and the missile bases in North Korea, if you so wish. That technology has been democratized to the point it's no longer only accessible to the President of the United States. It's accessible to anyone in the front room, even now. You know, it's incredible how this technology has moved. I think the same thing is happening when it comes to cyber weapons. So I will stress, since this is being recorded, this is declassified stuff, which is legitimately in the public domain. It's not like I certainly haven't hacked any, any, uh, any computers. But we've got the traces in the historical record that in uh, 1997, the authorization was given to the NSA to develop computer network attack technology. A few years later, in 2003, we've also got these first reports that, that are kind of hinting that actually that mission has been successful, and now we have the development of official doctrine, and that these weapons could be uh, applied in the real world. On the other side, we've also clearly got the development of adversaries and that the United States is not the only country which is developing this. And we've got indictments uh, against a, a certain other third party country uh, accusing them of having conducted cyber espionage from 2006 onwards. So we've got this evidence that there are uh, offensive cyber capability being developed by superpowers. And in fact, if we look at the same analogy for uh, satellites, uh, surveillance technology, Really, it's only going to be a matter of time before that technology becomes democratized and gets in the hands of unsophisticated threat actors. In fact, we only had to wait until 2016, where we've got the threat actors, the shadow brokers, who are putting up uh, a load of uh, offensive uh, cyber uh, uh, tools and exploits which they're claiming are coming from a, uh, a three-letter agency. It's put up for auction on August the 13th. We don't know whether that auction was successful or not, or whether uh, something changed within the motivations of the shadow brokers. But on April the 14th of this year, that code was put in the clear, available for all. Very, very quickly afterwards, We've got these traces of unsophisticated threat actors taking these tools that have been released online and going out and compromising systems. So all of a sudden, we've created this environment where we've got this democratization of very, very sophisticated tools and exploits and releasing that to unsophisticated threat actors to do as they wish. Our last factor is that of complacency. Actually, I'll ask the question again. When do you think the first vulnerability was discovered in, uh, and I'll use the term, electronic communications? Give me... Spot on. Absolutely spot on. Um, so Marconi, one of his first demonstrations of wireless tele uh, telegraphy in, uh, I think it was, I can't remember if it was 1900 or 1901, did a demonstration in a hotel in London about transmitting Morse code and decoding that in front of an audience. Uh, what he didn't know is at the time there was a prankster uh, in the next building who was actually doing the same thing and was uh, um, pranking his demonstration by sending uh, uh, offensive, shall we say, Morse code messages that were being decoded in the room whilst Marconi was trying to do his, uh, his genuine demonstration. So as soon as electronic communications has been discovered, we've got people that are hacking it. And the history of computing, if you think about Bletchley Park and the work that was done during Second World War, basically uh, they were exploiting vulnerabilities in the German cryptography. The history of computers is about the history of vulnerability and exploiting those vulnerabilities. As we are creating the internet and we're adding more and more systems to the internet, our number of vulnerabilities that are being discovered are actually starting
static, which in many ways is good news. It's not getting an incrementally worse problem. We're finding about the same number of vulnerabilities per year in 2016, more or less as in uh, uh, 2006. The really good news is that those vulnerabilities which are trivial to exploit have dropped from about 30% of vulnerabilities down to you know, slightly less than one in five. The bad news is one in five vulnerabilities that are still being found are actually trivially exploi ex uh, exploitable. And also, they're not getting patched. So SamSam, which was that sophisticated ransomware targeting systems exploiting network vulnerabilities, we know the vulnerabilities that were being exploited. They dated from 2010, 2012, 2013. When we looked in 2016 at the times that these were being exploited by the bad guys, we identified 3.2 million unpatched devices connected to the internet. So even knowing that these are quite important vulnerabilities that can be exploited remotely by attackers to get control of a, a, of a device, yeah, still not really being patched in the wild. So we created this environment where we've got the motivation for the bad guys to write ransomware, we've got the possibility of these things to spread, we've got a history of self-propagating code, and we've got many, many unpatched devices that are out there, potentially through a lack of knowledge or a certain degree of complacency, that these aren't really being taken seriously. Which brings us to the morning of May the 12th, of this year. Our very first trace, looking at our honeypot, port 445 connections, we've got this sharp uptick from 800 hours UTC where we've got a large, large number of connections being made to our port 445 honeypot. There's always a background level of noise, there's always connections going on, but you can see just how quickly that ramps up and we've got the spread of WannaCry captured in the data. This isn't our earliest trace. Our earliest trace comes from our DNS telemetry, where we have the first connection to that kill switch domain from 730 UTC. It's our very, very first connection that we see within our telemetry. And we think this is probably within a couple of minutes of the start of the infection. That then grew massively throughout the day. By the evening, 1800, we've got this enormous spike, which is probably done, to be fair, to a lot of, uh, of researchers looking at this. But we've got that trace captured from the very, very beginning of the infection going forwards. So we know, again, from what's been published uh, by late morning, we've got the NHS computers which are being infected. Uh, about 2 p.m., we've got that kill switch domain being registered, which is enough to actually then stop the spread of the malware if there's just some kind of splash screen there. By the late afternoon, we've got many in the uh, security industry saying, it's an email, it's an email. Well, uh, actually, no. Uh, by the early evening, we've got ourselves and others being able to say, yeah, it's a pure network worm. It's not being spread by email. But those connections and that uh, disruption is still happening because in 19th of June, which is more than a month after the malware has come out, we've got uh, manufacturing plants that are being shut down. And if we think that Conficker from 2008 is still in distribution now and still happening, I think we can be fairly sure that um, at least uh, WannaCry, despite the, uh, the kill switch, is probably still going, to, still going to spread in some way if it can't make that connection to the kill switch domain. So I don't think this is something which, it, which is going to go away. Obviously, it caused a large amount of damage and a large amount of havoc. However, I think we actually did pretty well. You know, at least in the UK, the banking system continued to function. You know, you could still get money out of the ATMs. Uh, the railways were still working. We still had transport. We didn't have traffic lights being taken down. And the lights stayed on. We still had electricity. So there's much to take as a positive note here. And there certainly is at least certain amounts of protection.
innovation happening in many critical infrastructures which were resistant to WannaCry, which is very, very good news. However, I said at the time, this is not the first worm to hit the internet, and it will not be the last. And so, obviously, just six weeks later, we've got Nietzsche, a, in this case, not a ransomware worm, but a wiper piece of malware self-propagating, spreading across the internet, again causing havoc in unsecured systems and taking down all sorts of critical systems. Almost certainly with a different intent than WannaCry, not ransomware, but a wiperware, a destructive piece of malware, nevertheless using also this self-propagating fashion in able to spread. Kind of WannaCry is acting as the thought leader for malware, showing the way to malware writers of just how destructive uh, self-propagating malware can be, and going on and inspiring others to conduct these kind of attacks. So, in terms of protection, what can we do? Well, working in the security industry, we're in a place to actually do something about this and to protect systems. Uh, there's only so many ways that you can do this. Uh, it doesn't have to be enormously complicated. Uh, the great kryptonite of ransomware are backups. If you've got good backups in place, then even if a system gets hit with, uh, with ransomware, you can restore and get it back to a function where it was before. If you're keeping that bad stuff outside of the perimeter of your organization and keeping it away from the end users, especially if it's coming through by malware, uh, through, uh, through email, or keeping those perimeter devices fully patched. Again, you're keeping that malicious stuff outside of your network. If it does get in, well, if you've got good network segregation, good network architecture, and you're actively looking and blocking that malicious network activity, we can stop it spreading. Good old-fashioned desktop AV still has its place. It's not necessarily the best protection that's out there, but it certainly is a lot better than nothing, and it will give you management of being able to deactivate the malware if you see it. And of course, the other big thing is preparing for it when it happens, knowing what to do, knowing who to call, knowing how, what you're going to do, and knowing how you're going to detect that. Because ultimately, these forces, these factors that have created WannaCry are still there. Ransomware is still there as an opportunity. This is a massive criminal opportunity for the bad guys out there. Self-propagating malware, it's still going to happen. We've still got this environment where it's possible. Democratization of threat and technology, that's just going to keep happening. So we've got a plan for it now. The sophisticated stuff, now in the hands of the superpowers, you can be certain that's going to get into the hands of the criminal threat actors and also the script kiddies eventually. And what we can act on and what we can reduce is that degree of complacency and expecting the worst and expecting that next piece of self-propagating malware because it's definitely, definitely going to happen. And what we want is now to be prepared for it so we can actually reduce the amount of impact that it will cause. And with that, I will thank you very, very much for listening. I strongly encourage you to go and read our blog where we uh, publish our research and open it up for questions. What? What more can I say? What more would you like to know? Yeah, please. What kind of messages were they sending to Marconi? Do you know what? I can't. I can't remember offhand. Um, it's on the. Uh, it is on the internet. If you um, if you search it, the guy who did it was um, uh, he was uh, I believe if I remember correctly he was a professional magician. Uh, who had a, um, a, a history of just like doing pranks and troll. Yeah, basically, this guy was the world's first troll. So we've got Marconi in front of a very, you know, very posh and uh, distinguished audience demonstrating this new, this new invention. And we've got the world's first troll nearby realizing that, in fact, this is a completely unauthenticated mechanism. Uh, I, you know, it was really, really childish stuff. It was something like Marconi smells or, or along those, those, those lines. But, you know, what a genius! to come up with this idea that here's this brand new mechanism 
that you know now gives us television it gives us mobile phones you know links the world together and here was this guy like no 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 i'm gonna make fun of this absolute genius um and it, and it showed the way forwards really for so much where we are now uh, i think it's partly part of, uh, of human psychology and human behavior of wanting to try and subvert things uh, but this guy to do it so early in this new me new new medium i just think was an absolute genius uh google it, it it's um it, it's out there there are reports about it. it it's i think it's fascinating please isn't the first destructive wiper that we've seen. If you go back, I think it's 2010, the Shah Moon uh, attacks in the Gulf, in the Gulf region, um, there, there was, uh, I think it was 10,000 laptops that were wiped in a single organization, in a single attack. So I think there we've got, at least that attack I thought was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Here we've clearly got a threat actor which is making a statement. They're doing this to say something. Um, rather than the criminal threat actors of trying to make money from it, rather than the hacktivists trying to score political points or spread a message, here we've got someone really making a very, very strong point. We can destroy you, basically. And I think we're seeing much the same thing in, yeah, yeah, this, again, was a strong message. It was strongly targeted against a single country. And, yeah, we've got this bit of, yeah, we can cause damage to your, to your infrastructure. So behind every attack, there is a person. There is someone conducting this attack. They have some kind of agenda, and there's something that they're trying to achieve. And I think thinking about you know, what, what are the types of threat actors that, are, that we're exposed to, what types of things can we be exposed to, and what are the, the, the people who would do us harm seeking to achieve? I think going down those, those routes and thinking about it, we can think about how we can uh, protect our systems or, or better target the protection that we've got in place in order to hit and prevent the types of attacks that we're like, to which we're likely to be exposed.